Hello, we are going to take a look at the second part of Creating the American Republic, which is part of Unit 4. So, moving on, we're taking a look at, we had to establish the executive branch, the authority of the executive branch. Um, with President Washington, he wanted to establish this framework of the executive branch. He had no one to follow. He was the first person that ever did that, and he knew that every decision that he made, future presidents would be making the same decisions. So he wanted to be very careful when he was making these decisions, something as little as what to call him. And he decided to go with Mr. President, or in his case, Mr. Washington, where you had the inaugural address. And with his inaugural address, he placed his hand on the Bible. Uh, first person to ever do it, and every president has done it ever since. Having that formal presidency, the people of the United States did to respect him, and so did the rest of the world. He didn't want to think that, he didn't want people to think that they were higher class or better than anyone else, but he wanted them to understand that this is the president, you need to respect the office of the president. And then with the help of Congress, with the creation of the cabinet, of putting people around him that can help him make decisions, and having that cabinet that has given him that advice. Because a president cannot be an expert in everything, and he really relies on these people around him to help him with that. Now, moving on, we're looking at stabilizing the economy. So, you have this economy, you have all this debt and everything. So, Hamilton was appointed as Secretary of Treasury, and he came up with this plan of stabilizing the American economy. And his plan had three parts to it. Number one, pay off debts. Number two, to have countries that are importing goods into the United States pay a tariff. And number three, creating the National Bank. So, with creating the National Bank, this started causing some problems because there's nothing in the Constitution that says you have the authority to create a bank. So, really what he was doing is he was asking Congress to expand their own powers, but yet he was saying that it is in the Constitution with the necessary and proper clause. When you're looking at um, Clause 18 of the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8. Now, there were many people that feared that this would give Congress too much power because if they started taking powers that aren't listed in the Constitution, where are they going to actually stop? So, Washington establishing um, his authority. So, he had a couple of challenges to his new government. And people were really looking to him to say, is this a legitimate presidency now? Is this a new, a good government? Is it going to work? So, two major challenges came out. You had the Northwest Territory with Native Americans, and then you had the Whiskey Rebellion that took place in Pennsylvania with farmers. In both instances, Washington used the military. He used force to show the power and authority of the new government. Not only, he didn't just come in and start using this force. He had the Constitution of him up to say that he was Commander-in-Chief, and he had the authority to do this. And also, the Constitution says that the executive branch and the president is supposed to enforce the laws. So again, in both these instances, turning to the Constitution to say that he does have this power and authority, and he will use it to preserve what is taking place with this new American government. Now, a lot of things were happening outside the United States. And they had to decide, should the United States get involved in these international issues? You had things like the French Revolution taking place. And remember, France helped us in our own revolution to gain our independence, so should we be helping them? Now, France and England were once again at battle with each other. Should we follow what we wrote in the Treaty of Paris and help the French against the British? And then you had Spain and New Orleans with them charging tariffs as we were going through and uh, passing through New Orleans on the Mississippi River. And then, of course, Great Britain was still in North America. Above all, the decision that was made by Washington was like, we're just going to stay out of everything. We have so much going on in our own country right now. We're just getting started. We need to focus on what's taking place here. So... <clears throat> Other countries weren't really letting us remain neutral. They kept on trying to pull us in. So Great Britain was attacking American ships. 
So we had to deal with this nation because it was directly impacting the United States now. And this led to Jay's Treaty. So when we came in, they said they'd stop attacking our ships. They're going to pay us back for this. We were going to pay back our war debts, which ironically enough, we were already going to do under Hamilton's financial plan. And then they were going to remove all their troops that were left in North America. Well, with us signing this, we kind of violated a treaty we had already signed with France with the Treaty of Paris. So they were upset. So they started attacking our ships. So then President Adams sent ambassadors over to France to talk to them to negotiate some type of peace and this didn't really go the way we wanted it to and this is what really the XYZ affair was about because we were disrespected and it got referred to as the XYZ affair and the US started preparing for war at this point and we did have an undeclared naval battle with France. Now President Adams and Congress refused to declare war because we didn't have a prepared military, and we also didn't have money to fight in a war. This upset U.S. citizens so, because if a country is disrespecting us, we should go to war with them and not let them do that, because other countries are going to do this. And this leads us to our next thing, the Sedition Acts. So citizens were speaking and writing bad things about President Adams and Congress for not declaring war. So Congress turns, or so, I'm sorry, so then, Yes, so Congress and President Adams turn around and they respond by passing the Sedition Acts, making it illegal to write or say anything bad about the government. And their punishment was jail and fines. Now, the thing with this is, passing the Sedition Acts really goes against the First Amendment to the Constitution. Now, as we've been learning in this class, Everything in American history is a cause and effect relationship, and the citizens responded by not re-electing Adams to his second term in office. So they elected Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson came in and really started undoing some of the things that were done under the Adams administration. Now with this, because Adams administration was really taking, giving a lot of power to government, and Jefferson wanted to go the opposite way. He wanted to reduce the power of government because he believed in that smaller governments. And so he repealed the Sedition Acts. He reduced the size of the government. He reduced the size of the army to just over 3,000. And with reducing the government, we didn't need as much money for the government to run. Thus, taxes were reduced. Now, Jefferson, as we've learned, is someone who really believes in following exactly as the Constitution is written. However, he went beyond the Constitution when he purchased Louisiana Territory for $15 million because he felt it was in the best interest of America. But again, this goes against his own beliefs. Now, really what you had taken place in America, we're taking a shift, you're looking at the formation of political parties. You had, these were formed because of the different beliefs. The different beliefs were in many issues. A couple of them that we really focused on in class was foreign policy, interpreting the Constitution, and the economy. So with your foreign policy, you had one side thought we should model ourselves after Great Britain. The other side we should model after France. Um, when you take a look at interpreting the Constitution, you had one side that said follow exactly as it's written. One side that says, well, yeah, you can follow it a little bit, but follow it loosely. And then the economy. One side believed that business was going to drive it in the merchant class, and the other side felt that it was going to be the farmers who would drive it. These differences in beliefs were led by the ideas of Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, yet again, as we've learned about debates they had previously had. Now, Taking a look at some other changes, you take a look at Marbury versus Madison. Not getting into all the details as we learned in class, just a brief overview of the case. This decision limited and increased the power of the Supreme Court at the same time. So when you're talking about Marshall making this decision, he increased and limited at the same time. Unbelievable, but he did it. The Supreme Court does not have the authority to tell another branch of government what to do. That's how he limited the power of the Supreme Court, saying that the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional. It goes against the Constitution, and the branch can't tell another branch what to do. Now, 
By doing this, he set the precedent saying the Supreme Court has the authority to interpret the Constitution, thus increasing the power of the Supreme Court. So that's how it increased and limited the power of the Supreme Court at the same time. Now, we, take, we took a look at social impacts. Now, we've seen a lot of demographic changes that were taking place in America from the 1790s up until the 1800s. You had an increase of population. You had an increase of almost 5 million people showing a change socially in America. People started moving to urban areas. So it, it was a small increase, only about 1%, but it was an increase because of industry and the Industrial Revolution. And we're going to learn more about that in the upcoming units, but with the Industrial Revolution and the factory system coming in, more people had job opportunities in the cities, and that's where they are moving. So literacy rates increased because more colleges were being opened. So you had a more literate.